You're listening to Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We now present our program, Fatima and the First Saturdays, brought to you by the Communal First Saturdays Apostolate. Here is your host, Dr. Katrina Layden. Hello, this is Dr. Katrina Layden, and you're listening to Fatima and the First Saturdays on Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. Let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I ask pardon of you for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, God wishes to establish devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the world, To do this, Our Lady gave us two special requests. For each individual, the consecration is a kind of renewal of one's baptismal vows. By consecration of nations, we recognize they belong to God and must love and serve Him. The first Saturdays is centered upon the Holy Eucharist. Of course, the Holy Eucharist is infinitely more important than baptism. However, We need to receive baptism first in order to receive the Holy Eucharist, Jesus himself. So, of Our Lady's two requests, the first Saturdays is the most precious to God, and what we are responsible for doing, let's do our part. But if we wish to establish devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, it's not enough for the first Saturday's devotion to be done privately only. As Our Lady said, it must be established in the world. To establish something, it must be visible and public. The first Saturdays must be established in parishes, and not in any public form, but in a way that is approved by the Church. Otherwise, if not public and communal, there is no way to know the faithful are fulfilling the practices of Our Lady's request for world peace. Our Lady would not be given the credit for the triumph. This would be an injustice against her heart, an obstacle to peace. What we call the communal first Saturdays is not only public, but approved by the church together with the use of the communal first Saturdays devotional book. Well, today I have so much news to share with you. Um, Exciting, very exciting. I, um, I don't know how many of you have heard, but we are just so elated. Sister Lucia has been declared venerable by the church. This is so awesome. We have been praying for this moment. We are uh, we've been praying for her. Uh, many of us have been praying for her beatification, and this is the step towards that. This is just um, absolutely fantastic. Thanks be to God. God is so, so awesome and just so excited. And as you know, um, for those of you who may be listening for the first time, or uh, Sister Lucia is very connected, obviously, to Fatima. She was one of the three little Fatima children and uh, so connected to the first Saturdays. Uh, Jesus and Mary appeared to sis, um, Sister Lucia uh, after uh, Fatima explaining what to do on the first Saturdays. Um, also, through, through the person of Sister Lucia, Jesus has asked us to spread the first Saturdays throughout the world. So I think just this declaring her venerable will also hopefully help bring attention to this in very this very need of the church to uh, both uh, for the faithful to practice and spread the first Saturday. So this is just so exciting. Um, also, I have some other special news for you. It just um, the communal first Saturday's devotional book has been translated into Portuguese. This translation received the Neil Ofstadt from the Vicar General, Father Jorge Manuel Faria Guadalajara, Diocese of Liera, Fatima. This is wonderful news. This now gives us the ability to spread the communal first Saturdays in Portugal, Brazil, and other Portuguese-speaking nations. I am actually in Fatima at this moment working to spread the communal first Saturdays among the Portuguese, and among those visiting from other countries. I actually almost had to cancel my trip as my passport had not come. However, our Lord and Our Lady must have wanted me to come because 90 minutes, an hour and a half before I had to leave for the airport to 
to um, make it my flight, my passport came. So it was just so close. And I'm just so thankful to God. And also, listen to this. This passport came on the Memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary this past Saturday. So uh, again, thanks be to God. That is um, just uh, just awesome. And just and also um, just such a blessing to hear this whole week and um, and, and today with all of you <laughs> um, from Fatima. I am also very thankful to be visiting today with the Fatima Dominican nuns of the Perpetual Rosary. I first met them 13 years ago during my last trip to Fatima and have kept in touch ever since. I thought all of you listening would enjoy getting to meet one of the sisters, a sister, and her name is Sister Lucia, um, and hearing how their work is related to the spread of the first Saturdays. These Dominican nuns of the Perpetual Rosary are responsible for the translation of Fatima and Lucia's own words from Portuguese into English. This is the book we quote regularly in the Fatima and the First Saturdays book and on this show. Also, for those of you who have the book, uh, Fatima and the First Saturdays, um, the yellow, yellow book, but it has a beautiful image of the Immaculate Heart of Mary on the cover, uh, along with the Eucharist and a monstrance. Well, this beautiful Im image is of the statue of their convent. So very, very special. So let me introduce um, Sister Lucia. Thank you again for being with us today, Sister. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Katrina, for inviting us to participate in this program. Um, I thank also all those who are listening to this program at this moment and those who may listen to it in the future and remind them all that wherever you may be, there is always someone praying for you. So no matter what life circumstances may come to, your, to you or to your loved ones, know that some are praying for you always, every day, and you are not alone. So anything that I can help um, Katrina with, I will be happy to try to answer her questions and um, learn along the way also. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Well, before uh, discussing the first Saturdays, which of course we have to discuss, I thought it would be great um, if you could tell all of us how you, this convent here uh, in uh, Fatima got started, a little history of that, if you could share with us. Yes. Um, the history goes back more or less to about 1910, uh, to give you a historical perspective. Um, the Dominicans came to Portugal in 1217, at the very moment that St. Dominic founded the order. He sent two of his friars, um, he sent them out two by two, and two came to Portugal at that time. So all through those centuries, um, of course there were ups and downs, but nevertheless, we arrive, if we arrive at 1910, uh, 1834 there was a persecution, but in 1910 all religious were expelled from, uh, from Portugal. And um, as a result, the Dominican order was more or less extinct in, in Portugal. In fact, we learned that in the moment of the apparitions of Our Lady, there were only two or three known Dominicans, known but working quietly <laughs> in, in Portugal. So in 1910, there was this persecution and the religious were expelled. Then World War II came. And after the war, um, the master of the order of Dominicans, decided or desired that the order would be restored, this province would be restored in Portugal. So in, in 1946, a French Canadian Dominican, Father Pius Marie Goudreau, uh, was assigned to come to Portugal from Canada to begin the work of restoring the province. And he um, was familiar already with the Dominican nuns of the Perpetual Rosary and thought he would like to have the nuns here as well, assisting um, basically through their prayer and sacrifice, primarily, in this restoration process. So he went to Rome to request of our foundress, uh, Mother Mary Louise Bertrand, to would she consider coming to Fatima to make a new foundation of nuns. Now, Mother had already made three foundations, so um, I presume she was a little bit tired. But in any case, <laughs> after, Imagine. after um, she prayed quite a bit, and, and she said yes. Uh, she came, of course, and looked at the situation here in Fatima, etc. And so then um, by 1954, the monastery was built and ready to open. And um, so June 16, 1954, our monastery opened. Um, and how, um, so how many, and where, where were the nuns from at that time? Okay, the sisters were from the United States. The founders was American. Oh, she, she was, was? She was from Philadelphia originally, wow. yes. And um, there were several from the United States and several from Ireland. 
So from Ireland. There were Irish and American at the time. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. How many? Do you know how many came? Oh, I the think there were. I think there were nine. I believe there were nine. Nine. Okay. I think so. Yes. Wow. It was a requirement. And um, today we are ten. Um, one of our sisters passed away in April. But um, we are ten and represent six different countries. So and we've been international from the beginning, and um, continue our Dominican monastic life here uh, in Fatima. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. And I thought that was interesting. So in 1910, that's when the Dominican order came back, or what? What was it? 1910? You mentioned that was when the persecution began by the government. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay, okay. And. Um, so at that point, all the religious were expelled. Okay. Oh, wow. The only ones who survived actually were the um, Irish Dominicans who had been in the country for centuries. And they they were um, um, not um, involved in this um, expel expelling of the religious because they had a connection, um, uh, uh, relationship, um, how shall I say, diplomatic, uh, whatever, mm-hmm. with, with the British government. Okay. So they were sort of protected in this. Oh, so they okay. remained through the whole thing. And of course, they had experiences through the persecution too. Then, but, okay. Um, but the Portuguese were all um, were sent away. Wow. And remember um, that this was just um, six years before the angel of Fatima appeared to the children and seven years before Our Lady appeared uh, here at Fatima, just for all of you to get that, um, you know, get to kind of get positioned in the timeline there. Um, well, that's, um, that's exciting. And it's neat how the Dominican uh, priest recognized mm-hmm. how important your prayers were and it helped get your convent established here with the mother superior. So well, in was- fact, in fact, um, um, in 1206, when St. Dominic was founding the order, it was actually the Dominican nuns who were founded first. The friars came second. We always we, 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 <laughs> you have to remind, we remind us. them of this. Yes. Oh, that's great. So yes, in 1206, the nuns were founded in Puyo, France. Southern France, and um, in 1216, the fathers were finally um, established. Okay, then, so you're there about 10 years before. Yes. So mm-hmm, it just mm-hmm, helps us remind mm-hmm. us how precious the prayers of the nuns are. Let yes, us all remember yes, that and pray for them. Yes, do pray for us. <laughs> yes, and vocations too. Yes. yes. Oh, that's that's um, really great. And how? And can you tell us how you came to Fatima? And you're American too, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Um, my own journey um, to enter here in Fatima, um, began as a pilgrim to Fatima. Oh. Um, I came as a young woman to Fatima with my youngest sister at that time. And I was working as a nurse in medical research. And I came to Fatima because my mother also had a great desire, great uh, devotion to Our Lady of Fatima and would often encourage me to come to the shrine. So that year, things worked out for some reason. And um, Providence, we'll say. <laughs> and I came to Fatima. And we spend one week, as no, usually the pilgrims do. At the end of that week, when I was going home, I knew there was something different for me in my life. And I would say over the years what I would kind of um, d- describe it as would be the grace of prayer. The grace of prayer. Because when I r- arrived home, I w- just wanted to pray. I had, and, and it was very difficult because going back to work was not so, <laughs> not so easy. <laughs> In any case, um, but I did find that over the next months and time, uh, I did. I was praying much more. Um, And then, by the grace of God, um, met a very good Dominican priest in D.C., who was my spiritual director, and eventually realized the call to the contemplative life. And um, then I returned to Fatima the following year to ask Our Lady, okay, this is what Jesus wants, now please tell me where I'm supposed to go. And um, meanwhile, I had read Fatima and Lucy's own words, and I saw that it was translated by the Dominican nuns of the Perpetual Rosary. Oh, I said, I'd like to meet them. <laughs> so I did. I came the next time I came to Fatima. I made a point of meeting the sisters, and that was, we could say, the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> of, yes, and I, I knew it was where I was supposed to be. Wow, and then you took the name Lucia. Well, Sister Lucy had been praying for my vocation, so I had I had a debt to pay in a certain sense. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yes. Did um, you get to meet her? No, I never no, met her. No, but she not. was praying for you. She was praying for me, yes. <gasps> yes. What is it? Wow, and what a special day this is for you. It is, yes. it is indeed. Yes. <laughs> it's really good news. And especially to happen on the birthday of Father Condor, because he was the promoter of the causes for 50 years. So being his birthday, and we get this news today of the venerable um, Sister Lucia, 
it's good news. God has it's everything planned out, all yes, details. Yes, no yes. coincidences. No coincidences. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that with us. That's mm-hmm. exciting. <laughs> I mean, well, it's just, it's really nice to hear that and uh, that you, and you responded to that call. You were able to listen and pray and, and accept that call that mm-hmm. um, some may get and not listen to. <laughs> so, well, I argued a bit with, the, I didn't argue with the Lord, but I, kept, no. I did say many times, are you sure? <laughs> oh. <laughs> because um, I was a person who was very much um, liked being at home, you know what I mean? And I love to travel, but I always like to go home. Mm-hmm. So to live in a foreign country, to go to a foreign country, and was um, unusual for me. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But anyway, the, all the grace was there, and um, you can't say no. In the end, you cannot say no, really. So God was yeah. sure, for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, so I did you have when you were speaking with the nuns that you met when you came here, mm-hmm. uh, did they share their experience about the translation they had? I know yeah. translation is not easy work. I've been I kind of been involved with the, our work when it's been translated into Spanish and then now in Portuguese. And it can be pretty tedious just making sure things oh, are yes, correct. Yes, yes. So what, what was the experience? Do you know? So, in fact, the first sister I met. Um, was one of the translators. Oh. So, um, and this good sister is still with us. She is 98 years old. <gasps> sister oh. Mary Deanne from County Wexford, Ireland. Wow, <laughs> Ireland again. There you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yes, the story was basically that um, a translation had been made, but um, the bishop was not so um, pleased with it because he, he, he realized at that time, at Don Juan, he was the bishop, um, that to promulgate these uh, memoirs, over the world in various translations um, would be a major step in making Fatima known. So he wanted a new and good English translation for the English-speaking world. So having the nuns here already who were English-speaking, uh, he, the Father Condor, the vice later, came and requested the nuns to make that translation. And uh, so, and of course, they agreed. And um, two, Sister Mary Deanne and Sister Mary Joseph, who was already deceased, those two sisters worked on the, directly on the translation. Other sisters, there were two other sisters who helped with the proofreading and the, all that. And there were, um, then because Sister Lucy, of course, um, includes the, some of the very um, local customs that they had, you know, mm. that we would not be familiar with, um, the sisters that had the help of the Dominican fathers who were familiar with all these um, customs and so they had their help in making sure that what they wrote was you know close to, as accurate as possible um, with Sister Lucia and that was one of the bishop's requests that the translation be done as closely and as accurately as possible to the original um, text of Sister Lucia oh so important mm-hmm. that's great of course. Mm-hmm. yeah do you know how long did they ever tell you how long that took sister, I can imagine sister that was a while. told me sister told me uh, three months they worked from February to April um, intensively, intensively. Wow, you know? but even still, so, that's exactly. amazing. And when you think they had no computers, so everything had to be <laughs> hand typed. And um, and those days too. Oh, the how shall I say the the um, conditions were very rustic here because at that time there were no very few buildings near us. It was all fields, and anyway, of course, there was no such thing as air conditioning. <laughs> Etc. So anyway, wow. they, they worked for three months and completed the work basically in three months. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think that's mm-hmm. impressive, especially mm-hmm. not having the computer or email or exactly, the exactly. online that we're all spoiled with. And even it takes longer than that much of the time. So that's pretty impressive. So God wanted that done. <laughs> he wanted it done. Yeah, I'll tell yeah. you a beautiful little story that Sister told me, Sister Mary Deanne told me. She said when she sat down to do the work, she opened the book. And the first thing, of course, she read was, your Excellency, because Sister Lucia begins by directing her work to the, to the bishop who has requested her to do this. So it begins by dear, Your Excellency. And she said, oh, and she looked up and she said near where the desk she was working, we had a huge, we had still have a huge um, painting, a large painting of Don Jose, who was the bishop at the time and the one to whom Sister Lucia was writing. So she looked up at the picture after she, this daunting work that was set before them. And she looked up at the picture and she realized, oh, my goodness, he's right there helping us, wow. the bishop. It was a lovely little detail of the story that she was still remembers after all those years. So wow. and I had to share that because um, I think it shows one thing, the heart that went into this work. You know, it wasn't just a, a translation of a book, basically. There was 
her heart was in it with the other sisters as well. Wow. It was a work of love. <laughs> yes, and we thank you for it too. And all of you, and we wouldn't even have this program if we didn't have her words. So that's, that's just amazing. Yeah, so um, yeah. Well, thank um, Sister Marie Diane. I, shall, I actually I shall got to meet her 13 oh, years yes, ago, but did. I didn't realize... Um, I didn't, and she was, um, she got to meet my little nephew and um, niece, but also, but I didn't realize that she was involved in the translation. So that's pretty mm. neat. I got mm. to meet her. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Well, um, if I'll write with you, I'd like to, um, I, you know, I understand that your monastery published a book by Father Marcel, uh, Marceliano Yameras, a, a Dominican OP, mm-hmm. on the Rosary and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you, in, in a moment, you, your audience will understand why I'm asking you about this question, but um, can you tell us about this book? Well, it's not actually a book. It was an article, a very long article, written in 1950 for the Thomist magazine or journal in the States, which is published by the Dominican Fathers in the St. Joseph province, that's the east of the United States. And um, I came upon it in our library in an old tattered copy. Um, and I, it was such a gem, I asked if we could please reprint it. So that's what we've done. We reprinted it. This um, book, or this article, I should say, Fatima, the Rosary, and the Heart of Mary. So it's Fatima, the Rosary, and the Heart of Mary. So his whole father... Um, um, Marceliano, is, his whole effort is to show us, to teach us in a very theological way and also practical way, um, the connection, the link between the Holy Rosary and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, our Mother. And if you don't mind, I can just read a little bit from the introduction that we wrote to this that maybe give an idea. That would be great. Um, so Father was writing in 1950 which was just 20 years after the approval of the apparitions of Our Lady and Fatima. And he arrived at the very heart of the message and requests of the Most Holy Virgin. They were, of course, as we know, the call to pray the rosary every day and offer loving devotion and reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In the actual words of Our Lady herself, she said, pray the rosary every day and God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. In fact, these two themes cannot be separated, and it may be that one of the purposes of the apparitions was to teach us this great lesson. The prayer of the rosary was born from the deep contemplative silence of the heart of Mary. Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart, as St. Luke tells us. So Mary's immaculate heart is the Bethlehem of the Holy Rosary. I don't know if we continue with a little bit more, but sure. Um, okay, if there's time. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, we have time. Um, just uh, another thought from this same introduction. In Fatima, the children were enveloped by the light that streamed from the hands of the Most Holy Virgin. This light, which penetrated their hearts and the innermost depths of their souls, caused them to see themselves in God, who was that light. The rosary in our hands becomes an instrument of light for us, an instrument of grace. The rosary is a way of prayer that forms us in Christ, in his life and in his mysteries. The rosary is a school of the gospel, where the Virgin Mary, Mother of Christ, is our most humble teacher. Father Marceliano leads us into this school of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the school of her virginal maternal love, where she pondered the saving mysteries of her divine son. So that is the basis of 1950, but which remains so relevant today. And um, each time I enter this book, it's a little bit like entering Sister Lucy's memoirs and even scripture. Every time we enter the scriptures, we find something new. We cannot help but find Mm -hmm. something new. Um, and I do the, I find the same with this book and with Sister Lucy's memoirs. I find something new each time. So these works are inspired. Mm-hmm. And that is why I think we continue to, of course, for the scripture. But um, with these other works, I think we can say that they too were inspired. And that is why we continue to find um, gems, so to speak, in them. But anyway, we, we um, republished it, um, reprinted it, we should say, and it's available. Um, we had permission, of course, from the Dominican Fathers, 
uh, in the St. Joseph province to do this. I'm sure they were more than happy for you to, <laughs> to give you that permission. So, um, but that's beautiful. And just that school of the Immaculate Heart. And we totally believe that too. And the re, um, one of the reasons I hoped Sister would um, discuss that work is because, um, well, a couple of reasons. One, Our Lady, uh, she asked for devotion to the Immaculate Heart at Fatima and the Rosary. So she joined those devotions together. And in the communal for Saturdays, we've integrated this. So we have the our signature rosary, the uh, rosary. We join the devotion to the Mac and Heart of Mary with the rosary. So if um, if you if you ever are blessed, blessed to be able to see 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 it in action, or even in the book, you'll see that each decade of the rosary is introduced with reflection, um, calling to mind Our Lady's Immaculate Heart related to that mystery. And then we follow it with just, you know, a verse of scripture after related to that mystery again. So we join the two devotions together and it becomes what we call a double powered rosary. So it's just beautiful. But it was, um, again, uh, this the work that Sister Lucia talked about um, definitely um, is uh, just helps show how important that is to, to do. So before um, we get into, of course, the first Saturday specifically, um, I wanted to uh, just let all of you um, know, for those of you who have met, may have just recently joined, this is Dr. Katrina Layden, and you are listening to Fatima and the First Saturdays on Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. Today, I am in Fatima and am just um, and am interviewing uh, Sister Lucia. She is a, a Fatima Dominican nun of the Perpetual Rosary. Um, we discuss the history of their convents, their translation of Fatima in Lucia's own words, from Portuguese to English. Also, the book they published or reprinted on the Rosary and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And their work, um, and we will be um, speaking about their work to spread the first Saturdays. And also, if um, any of you haven't heard or missed the beginning, um, again, the, um, Sister Lucia from one of the three children, the one from one of the three children of Fatima, she has become uh, declared venerable by the church. So exciting. So I'm so excited be, to be able to do this uh, uh, radio program um, uh, and to be able to share that and also being from Fatima um, today. Um, if you missed this interview, um, you can listen to the recorded podcast that will be available soon after the program today. We will now continue our um, uh, our show um, with a more from Sister um, Lucia, the Dominican nun here at um, Fatima. So, um, Sister Lucia, can you? I um, I know you've been you and your nuns have been promoting the first Saturdays and um, here in Fatima, and I was just wondering if you could tell us something about this. Okay, um, I would say that from the very beginning, of course, our presence here, um, we could not help but be a big part or a part of spreading the whole message of Our Lady of Fatima, um, in particular to the English-speaking world. And over these uh, course of these uh, decades, we have um, done a great deal, I believe, um, even before I came and then since I've come to. And um, because we are Dominican nuns of the Perpetual Rosary, of course, it's in the heart. You cannot <laughs> separate this, um, uh, this mission of spreading the, the message of Our Lady the love of Our Lady across the world. So the first mean, means we have of spreading the message before we get to the first Saturdays, um, I would say is through correspondence because we have correspondence from being an international shrine. Uh, people write to us from all over the world, um, particularly, of course, the English speaking world. And um, so this is our first means that we've been using all these years. And the correspondence can be very, very heavy at times. Uh, thanks be to God. Um, we receive pilgrims who come uh, to Fatima and also um, with them encourage and instruct as best we can whenever with the opportunities we have um, about the message of Fatima, and which includes the whole message. We publish each year um, at Christmas time a little newsletter uh, called Friends of Fatima. And this is um, news about our monastery, of course, but also includes many articles on various aspects of, of, of Fatima. You know, Fatima, someone described it as a, like a jewel with many facets. So it's not possible to just say one thing about Fatima. There's so many different, um, uh, not angles, but um, how would you say, and it's in, in like a prism, you know, the different shades and lights and, and things that you see. So um, it's so deep. It's so deep. 
for the first Saturdays, um, of course, um, we include this um, articles. We wrote recently is several articles on the first Saturdays in our newsletter, and um, can include this instruction in the with uh, those who we meet or who, to whom we write. I wrote the other day to a lady and um, sent. We have a small um, paper this size, A4 size of um, or A5. Excuse me, on the five first Saturdays, what Our Lady asks. Okay, and so I've been putting those into all my envelopes, all the letters I'm <laughs> sending out. And one lady wrote back, and she said, um, she sent five dollars, and she said, please, could I get this in Spanish? Mm. So I was really encouraged, <laughs> and of course we'll try. But anyway, um, so through the correspondence and through the um, meeting the pilgrims here, we try. Um, in a particular way, I might say, um, as we talked about yesterday when we met Katrina, how important it is for the people to understand sort of the why of what we do or what Our Lady is asking for. Um, many years ago, I think it was 1991, I recall a, a group of pilgrims came from Russia. It was the first pilgrimage um, after the Berlin Wall came down and all that, all those events. And they came to visit us. And one of the ladies, uh, several, some were Orthodox, some were Catholic, um, Roman Catholic, and but one of the ladies, several of them were crying. And one of the ladies said to us, um, you know, why did you continue to pray for us all those years? You know, wow. And so, so she knew evidently that you know. And so the, our eldest sister at the time simply replied, because Our Lady told us to. <laughs> so it was so simple, and it was so true, because that was exactly right what it was. So um, these um, proofs, we can say, these um, moments that the Lord gives us to reinforce us, to encourage us to continue, uh, that was a profound meeting for me, uh, to meet those people who had come um, at that moment. So for the first Saturdays, we want the people to try to help them understand what's, um, what is the reason? I mean, what, why are we doing this in a certain sense? I think it's, it's very clear. We spoke already, Katrina spoke already of the, um, our, our Sister Lucia's memoirs. And in there, we learn that in that July 13 apparition, Our Lady links, um, and just recall the words of Lucia in that, Sister Lucia in that, uh, at that moment. Um, you have seen, Sister Lucia writes, the hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. And then she goes on, if they do what I say, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. The war is going to end. But if they do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out. War will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. And this was really prophecy because Pius XI wasn't on the scene yet. Exactly. They didn't even know who he was. They didn't even know who he was. And then she describes what will happen. So the, here's the important part when she says, to prevent this, to prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the commute. I'm sorry, I'll repeat that. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. So Our Lady presents these two requests as a preventive measure. She tells us what could happen, but here's how to prevent it. Mm -hmm. Now, as we know, unfortunately, we didn't use the preventive measure yes. to the extent that it was needed. And so she, Our Lady continues, if not, Russia, she, Russia, will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions, etc. Now, my point here is that Our Lady links these preventive measures with Russia, okay? And um, the scholars of Fatima, um, the holy priests we've known here in Fatima over the many, many years, have always pointed out that when we speak of Russia, you know, when the lady spoke of Russia, she was talking, speaking of the, those who were deceived into this error, this great deception of, of communism, um, militant, atheistic materialism. So, and we know for, uh, for a fact that millions of Russian people were killed, were murdered in this whole process. So um, we, that needs to be made clear. That, um, and we also know that Russia was the la uh, land of Holy Mary, where um, every home had the icon of Our Lady present. So these people were 
Marian people. They loved Our Lady, the Mother of God. So when you say Russia was... The people, right? The, yes. And then, and then, unfortunately, the communist government exactly. didn't love God, didn't love Our Lady, and exactly. it, it took over Russia, right? Okay. So um, these errors, we've got to, I think, we try to help the people understand what are these errors that um, Our Lady refers to. And um, if you don't mind, I would um, refer to two different um, documents. One is the encyclical written by Pope Pius XI in 1937, which is on communism. And I, it's very long, so certainly I won't read the whole thing by any means. But we can show a little bit um, of what he said to give us an idea. Because he, in the first half of his encyclical, he speaks of the actualities of Russian communism of Soviet communism. And um, in the second half, he teaches us what we can do, basically, or what we should be doing. So the, um, I'll read a couple paragraphs from there to just introduce you to this um, reason why Our Lady asked for us to, to um, show this devotion, to establish this devotion to her heart. So he opens, um, more or less, talking about the promise of the Redeemer brightens the first page of history of mankind. And he speaks about the fall. And then he goes on and he says that um, this is Pope Pius XI speaking. He says, nevertheless, the struggle between good and evil remained in the world as a sad legacy of the original fall. Nor has the ancient tempter ever ceased to deceive mankind with false promises. It is on this account that one convulsion following upon another has marked the passage of the centuries down to the revolution of our own days. This modern revolution, he's speaking of the Russian revolution, it may be said has actually broken out or threatens everywhere, and it exceeds in amplitude and violence anything yet experienced in the preceding persecutions launched against the church. Entire peoples find themselves in danger of falling back into a barbarism worse than that which oppressed the greater part of the world at the coming of the Redeemer. Now he speaks um, about the situation in Spain at that time, the persecution that was going on in Spain by the communists. Nor can it be said that these atrocities, he's referring to the deadly persecution underway in Spain at that time, are a transitory phenomenon, the usual accompaniment of all great revolutions, the isolated excesses common to every war. No, they are the natural fruit of a system which lacks all inner restraint. Some restraint is necessary for man considered either as an individual or in society. Even the barbaric peoples had this inner check in the natural law written by God in the heart of every man. And where this natural law was held in higher esteem, ancient nations rose to a grandeur that still fascinates us, more than it should, perhaps, certain superficial students of human history. But, and here is the key sentence, I think, but to tear, to, but tear the very idea of God from the hearts of men, and they are necessarily urged by their passions to the most atrocious barbarity. Wow. And then he goes on to say that by making these observations of this of the Russian Revolution, the Russian communism, he is not referring, he says, um, he's not condemning the Russian people en masse. For them, he said, we cherish the warmest paternal affection. Um, okay, now... Um, if we go forward just a little bit now, from 1937 to 19, um, 70 years, 19, um, what does that bring us to? 1990, when Father Condor's book was uh, was written. Again, this the purpose of this is simply to help us understand the um, importance, the meaning, and the urgency of following what Our Lady said, and in particular these first Saturday devotions which have so many ramifications and implications. So Father Condor wrote in his book, now Father Condor was a man who was born in Hungary. He spent 50 years as the vice postulator for the causes of beatification of the little shepherds. So he knew their story very well. He was a priest very close to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. 
and he also, having been born in Hungary, experienced communism firsthand. So we take his words, I think, as um, as a strong um, proof of what we're fa- what we were facing. He wrote, Father Condor wrote in his book. Um, his book is called "Are You Willing to Offer Yourselves to God?" It's the whole theme is on reparation, and he wrote this uh, as part of his text. It is indisputable indisputable that in the 20th century, historians, sociologists, and culturalists point to Russian communism as the central phenomenon of our contemporary history. It was the underlying phenomenon and the driving force governing the concerns of all the nations on earth. And if communism imposed itself on the world, without doubt that world and the church herself suffered the most violent shock of all its history. It is necessary to understand this in its most radical sense, that no other precedent for revolution was ever known. It was not the case of imposing any sociological, philosophical, or cultural vision for which other revolutions were fought in centuries past. It was the case of imposing a total revolution such that it was fundamental to extract from man his natural base, which is God. Now, as we read already in the Holy Father's encyclical, he said exactly the same thing. Therefore, more than a sociological revolution, communism was a new religion. It was a direct and explicitly religious revolution, that is, an atheistic and materialistic religion in which mere matter was the God. So it is extraordinarily interesting that Fatima brings us a message of salvation directly related with this central phenomenon, the most important event of the century. The relation between the time of the Bolshevik Revolution and the apparitions of Fatima is not a simple chronological coincidence. It is before anything else, and very clearly, an intervention from heaven to propose to us a message as fitting antidote against that terrible evil that threatened us. Now, there is more text, of course, but this is um, important, I think, for all of us to try to grasp um, this terrible evil that was um, uh, promulgated um, from the eastern part of of Europe. And um, at the same time, it was really a revolution, we could say, a revolution of hatred, hatred for God, and hatred for the human person who is God's beloved creature. So there's this revolution of hatred that is launched from the East, and Our Lady on the western shore of of Europe launches her revolution of love, of her immaculate, maternal, virginal love. And this is what she promises will triumph. Yes, absolutely. And what I think is interesting, and um, that Sister Lucy also, you know, she... Okay, so I just, um, again, I love that quote from Our Lady. Um, She, on July 13th, 1917, she said, if you do what I tell you, many souls will be saved and there will be peace, a period of peace. If not, Russia will spread her errors. And with Sister Lucia uh, from the uh, nuns of the Perpetual Rosary and Fatima just shared with us um, some, some evidence that, you know, we didn't do what Our Lady told us. The errors of communism, which we're talking about errors of Russia, meaning errors of communism, they spread throughout the world. So, and uh, as we've spoken in our other shows before, there's um, uh, some more history behind this. Blessed, Our Lord appeared to Blessed Alexandrina. She's also considered one of the, uh, the fourth seer of Fatima from Portugal and asked for the consecration of the world then because Russia had spread her errors throughout the world at that time. So this is what's so important and um, to to know, and that by doing the first Saturdays, um, we can we can fulfill that second request that Our Lady asked. The first has been done, the consecration. The second one is what we need to do to combat all of these errors and um, to fulfill Our Lady's request and bring that salvation of souls and the period of peace that she promises and the triumph of her immaculate heart. And we um, just um, heard. So, um, Sister, you had some more to share with us. One little, one final quotation from another Holy Father, Holy Pope, uh, Pope Pius X. Um, speaking of this uh, counter, um, how, how should we say, counter-revolution of love. You know, even Pope Benedict XVI spoke of this. But um, led by Mary and those who place 
So we are part of this counter-revolution of love with Mary when we place ourselves totally in the refuge of her Immaculate Heart. Mary, who was God's own missionary, came from heaven to reawaken the world to the profound message of the gospel of salvation. Mary, mother came to Mary, our mother, came to three of her smallest uneducated children and called them to respond to the gospel of love and mercy. When she said to them, are you willing? And they said, yes, and became her instruments of grace for the eternal salvation of countless others. Our Lady is calling us and asking us the same question. Are you willing to offer yourselves? So I close uh, my thoughts and words with this quotation from Pope Pius X. Thirteen years before the Fatima apparitions, Pope Pius X concluded his encyclical written for the 50th anniversary of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception with these words. And I think we can apply them to today and to Our Lady's um, apparitions here. He wrote, True, we are passing through disastrous times when we may well make our own the lamentation of the prophet. There is no truth and no mercy and no knowledge of God on the earth. Blasphemy and lying and homicide and theft and adultery have inundated it. That's from Hosea. Yet in the midst of this deluge, the Pope continues, of evil, the, the Virgin Most Clement rises before our eyes like a rainbow as the arbiter of peace between God and man. I will set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be the sign of a covenant between me and between the earth. From Genesis. Let the storm rage and sky darken. Not for that shall we be dismayed. And the bow shall be in the clouds, and I shall see it and shall remember the everlasting covenant. Also from Genesis. And there shall, be no, there shall no more be waters of a flood to destroy all flesh. Oh yes, the Pope concludes. If we trust as we should in Mary, we shall recognize in her that virgin most powerful who with virginal foot did crush the head of the serpent. Thank you. Awesome words. And yes, Our Lady will triumph. And um, and we need we need all of all of you listening, all of you Catholics to please do the first Saturdays. And again, um, again, we can't say that enough. <laughs> so. Um, Thank you again, sister, for being with us. This is quite a treat for not just me, but for our whole audience. We are very <laughs> privileged. I uh, consider very privileged to be part of this program. We thank you for your presence here, and um, we'll continue to pray for all. Oh and wow! That's why we are here. That's, <laughs> that's we're great. Here. So all of you are receiving these wonderful, precious prayers. So very nice gift for us all. Thank you. Well, as we come to the close of our program, um, we'll, uh, I'll let, uh, our plan for our next program, unless we get more surprises like this time, will be to continue talking about com um, communal uh, prayer in the first Saturdays. And it will again uh, air again this coming Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Everything we discuss relates to Fatima and the first Saturdays. You will not want to miss this program. Um, there are study groups using the book Fatima and the First Saturdays. People from different parts of the world connect online. You are welcome and invited to register for our next groups that start in September. Registration is already open. You can go to communalfirstsaturdays.org. Again, that's www.communalfirstsaturdays.org. Please remember that Radio Maria is 100% listener supported. We depend on the generosity of our listeners. There are many ways you can help. You can make a donation on the phone at 1-888-408-0201. Again, that is 1-888-408-0201. You can also go to www.radiomaria.us. Again, radiomaria.us and click on ways to donate up at the top. Your donation will be a great gift. Remember, to fulfill the first Saturdays, there are four practices, each with the intention of making reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. These practices are one, confession, two, receiving Holy Communion, three, praying five decades of the rosary, and four, the separate and additional 15 minute meditation on the mysteries of the rosary while keeping Our Lady company. Each of these four practices need to be done 
with the intention of making reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. If you don't do one of the practices or don't do each practice, practice in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, you have not done the first Saturdays. We don't want this to happen to you. So be sure to download the free brochure that gives you essential information about the first Saturdays. When you go to the website, click on the button that reads free brochure. Again, the website is www.communalfirstsaturdays.org. Remember, God wishes to establish devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the world. To do this, Our Lady gave us two special requests. For each individual, the consecration is a kind of renewal of one's baptismal vows. By consecration of nations, we recognize they belong to God and must love and serve him. The first Saturdays is centered upon the Holy Eucharist. Of course, the Holy Eucharist is infinitely more important than baptism. However, we need to receive baptism first in order to receive the Holy Eucharist, Jesus himself. So of Our Lady's two requests, The first Saturdays is the most precious to God and what we are responsible for doing. Let us do our part. But if we wish to establish devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, it's not enough for the first Saturday's devotion to be done privately only. As Our Lady said, it must be established in the world. To establish something, it must be visible and public. The first Saturdays must be established in parishes and not in any public form, but in a way that is approved by the church. Otherwise, if not public and communal, there is no way to know the faithful are fulfilling the practices of Our Lady's request for world peace. Our Lady would not be given credit for the triumph. This would be an injustice against her heart, an obstacle to peace. What we call the communal first Saturdays is not only public, but approved by the church together with the use of the communal first Saturdays devotional book. We now in English, Spanish, and now in Portuguese. This book, of course, can be used in parishes. However, it can also help you if you need to do the first Saturdays privately. If you are fulfilling the first Saturdays privately, consider helping start the communal first Saturdays in your parish. A good good way to do this is to join our spreading group online. Our next one is in the fall. If you are interested, please contact us at info at communalfirstsaturdays.org. Again, that's info at communalfirstsaturdays.org. In the interim, please be sure to pray for more parishes to start the communal first Saturdays. Let us end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O most holy Trinity, I adore you. My God, my God, I love you in the most blessed sacrament. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, and before we close, just I want to give you um, the website for Sister Lucia and uh, the her fellow Dimin- the Monastery 12. of Pius XII. Um, fat- www.fatimadominicans.com. Again, that's www.fatimadominicans.com. Thank you. So I hope you all have a very blessed week. This is Dr. Katrina Layden with Fatima and the First Saturdays. Until next week.